Hello, hello, and hello. Welcome to First Fridays with Finn Formica. I am Finn Formica, obviously, because I'm talking to you out there today. I call it First Fridays because I'm going to be interviewing real Detroiters, musicians, artists, and the like. And I will be airing two episodes every first Friday of the month. The reason that I do call the show First Fridays is because one of the bands or artists that I will be interviewing will be performing at our First Fridays at Flamingo Vintage. It is a vintage clothing store in southwest Detroit, and the owner is the love of my life and the reason I moved to this beautiful city, Nikki Nugel. I hope you enjoy everything that I'm going to be doing. And yes, I'm a little nervous, but I uh, figured, what the fuck, I'm just going to do it and have fun with it. As my producer, Sean, and uh, my girlfriend and many others have said, just fucking do it. And that's the kick-ass punk rock attitude that I love about Detroit. This is my adopted city now, and I'm very excited about living here. My first guest will be Danny Croha, one of my favorite people in the city. He's played with the Gories and the Demolition Doll Rods, and he's one hell of a guy. We're going to talk about his upbringing, how he got started in music, the bands, the tours, the city, and just his take on what he's up to and how things are going. I've been honored to see him play a few different times in the city, and actually we had him for an event at our shop last summer. So I hope you enjoy. Like I said, this is my very first one, but I'm going to get better, I assure you. So here we are with Danny Croha, my first guest. Hello, and welcome to the very first edition of First Fridays with Finn Formica. We're down at the Russell Industrial Center, and uh, my guest is my pal and um, one of Detroit's favorite sons, Danny Croha. How are you, Daddy Danny? Ah, I'm good. Thanks, Finn. Cool. Well, thanks for coming. I appreciate having you. My first one. Uh, good to be here. It's an honor. It's an honor. Uh, real quick, you know, I wanted to read something to kind of begin this, uh, and it's uh, something I'd read. Um, it says, Third Man Records on the Gories the best garage band in America since the 60s. Very primitive. They made people with less paws and Marshall Amps look like idiots. <laughs> That's from Jack White. Jack White wrote that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was great. Uh, it also says, uh, the Gories began in the cultural vacuum of Detroit, 1986, with humble beginnings at a community concert series through a tumultuous end of their 1992 European tour. This is a band who influence has outstretched the ground they covered. Rooted in the primal, primitive underpinnings of 50s rhythm and blues and unhinged 60s guitar punk, the sound they came to was wholly their own. While band members Mick Collins and Dan Croha would go on to wider recognition in the Dirt Bombs and Demolition Doll Rods, respectively, the Gory should be viewed in the same influential context as the Velvet Underground and the Cramps. It's high time the Gories get their due. So, uh, Man, you know, <laughs> I mean, you can't really uh, go back from that, you know, um, right, all the music right. you've done in the city and uh, throughout the world and that kind of thing and all the fans you have. Um, do you want to talk about Detroit and growing up here and uh, anything, you know, musically you might want to talk about? So, uh, Well, yeah, I grew up in Detroit on the uh, north side, like northwest side, right. eight mile in Livernois area. Um, I don't know. A, a more specific question, right? Would be. <laughs> right. I don't know. You know how to begin this. Well, let's talk. About maybe uh, to begin with, uh, maybe what your musical influences were, those sort of things. Um, well, let's see. When I was a little kid, um, I really liked the Partridge Family because I liked Danny Bonaducci. Right. Well, yeah. You know, <laughs> little redheaded punk, yeah. and. Um, and I liked stuff that was happening, you know, watching cartoons like Josie and the Pussycats and 
uh, the Groovy Ghoulies and nice. uh, I don't know. This is I'm talking like 1970, early 70s. Um, you know, stuff like that, uh, bubblegum stuff. And when I was a little kid, I really liked that. And then, um, you know, just hearing Top 40 stuff on the radio because my mom would play, like, Top 40 CKLW, nice. which is a famous Detroit, Windsor, Detroit station. And, you know, like, hits of the early 70s. You know, like, I remember when, like, Ballroom Blitz by The Sweet was a big hit or... Bang and Gong by T-Rex was yeah. a big hit, that kind of stuff. And then the Carpenters and all that stuff, too. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and then um, when I was in high school, well, when I was, like, in middle school, I guess, I discovered FM rock radio, right. you know. So then I started, like, getting into, um, like, the British Invasion stuff, because they would play that stuff sometimes, you know, they'd play like Animals and Rolling Stones and The Who and uh, Kinks. Nice. And I started really liking that stuff when I got into high school. And so then when I was in high school, I sort of pursued more of that, you know, discovering that rock and roll British Invasion stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of like the early influences, I guess. Right, nice. So when did you start playing music, I guess? Maybe grade school, the high school kind of thing? I started playing in grade school. I started playing the tuba. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yep, I played the tuba in grade school. So I basically started out playing bass. That was right. the bass of the group. And um, my uh, teacher, I didn't really know that he liked my playing that much until the last concert when I was about to graduate from grade school and he after we were done with the last song he made this little speech right. about how he's gonna miss my playing and how much he enjoyed having me and I never knew this like wow. he never said anything to me like this and he made this big speech, and well, not a big speech, a little speech, right. in front of the whole crowd of parents and every families that were there. And he said, let's play that last song again. I want to hear this guy play one more time. Man, I blew the hell out of that horn. I played <laughs> that awesome. tuba so damn loud. <laughs> but it was actually a sousaphone. It was the marching one, you know, with right. the big bell, and it was in a special chair like that held it up you know so i didn't actually have to hold it because i was a skinny little kid right i actually had to have a a guy on the football team go down and get it out of the band room and bring it up to the practice room because i couldn't even carry the thing myself wow so yeah this i played that that was my first instrument excellent and i always wanted to play guitar though right you know? but my mom and dad i don't know my mom wouldn't get me a guitar they wouldn't they my mom said i was like too young to play guitar or something and it just wasn't i don't know it wasn't in their plans for me so it wasn't until after i got old enough to kind of get away from them that i started playing guitar nice well why did i did get one <laughs> yeah when i was like 18 i think i bought my first guitar when i was 19 maybe 18 or 19. wow well, that's cool man there's people from all over glad you got it too i guess now <laughs> um so when did you meet Mick, that kind of thing, you guys? Um, so I met Mick through a friend of mine who lived out in the suburbs. I got into a band after I went to college for one year, and then I was formally invited to not return because I my <laughs> grades were too low. Right. Because I had no interest in being there. Right. You know, yeah, I didn't course. do any homework. I didn't really go to the classes. Uh, I treated it as like a vacation away from home, which was, you know, that was my privilege uh, afforded me that, fortunately. And so I just wasted my parents' money for a year and, and started to dream about being in a band right. and reading rock and roll books and started hanging out with a guy who played guitar and he had a Who song book. Nice. Um, for some reason, all the songs in the book were in different keys than they were on the record, unbeknownst to both of us. So I had trouble singing them, and I didn't understand why, but I started to do that. And then a friend of mine bought a bass, and I started playing bass, and we started collecting records. There was a college radio station on campus at this college I went to, and 
we uh, raided the radio station and stole all the good records out of the <laughs> nice. station because they had been there since the 60s. Like, like they had all these great records from the late 60s. So we stole like the uh, MC5 record and Velvet Underground record and a Them with Van Morrison, like his first band. They had a Them record. And I heard Baby Please Don't Go by Them and that blew my mind, you know. So I started wanting to pursue more of that kind of music and started learning how to sing and play and dreaming about being in a band. And so as soon as I got home, when I was invited not to come back, <laughs> then I was living with my mom and dad again, working at my dad's factory. And um, I went to a REM concert in Royal Oak and met some guys there who uh, lived in Madison Heights, a Detroit suburb. And they had a they were starting a band and we started talking and got their numbers. I ended up, you know, one guy played guitar, there's a bass player. They already had like a guitar and bass, but I, I said, well, I'll be the singer, you know? Oh, yeah. So I talked to these guys and I ended up going over there and we actually practiced in one guy's garage in Madison Heights. We were literally a garage band. And then um, after a while, we got a, a practice space in a storage unit. And, um, did that but i don't even know where i'm going with this where am i going with this <laughs> oh man i don't care just keep, just, just keep going how about it it's my uh, very first one i don't it's, know um, so what did i do so uh let's see the history um so uh help me off and guide me here what do you want to know <laughs> i don't know man you know we're just talking baby uh okay so these guys up. were at this rem concert and then i met him and started singing and yeah, you were like, where did I start? How did I start doing this? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, so then I was with a band. Okay, okay, that's where I was going. So I'm in a band with these guys from Madison Heights, and they, they were hanging out with folks from Rochester. So I started meeting some folks from Rochester. I met this guy in Rochester who had met Mick downtown wow. at a, an event at Hart Plaza. It was a King Sonny Ade concert. Wow. And he met Mick because... He was wearing a T-shirt that Mick liked, so Mick went up and talked to him because Mick is obsessed with T-shirts, and he had a good T-shirt. So Mick went up and talked to him and got his number. So I was at this guy's house in Rochester, and Mick called him, and uh, the guy whose house I was visiting said, hey, there's a dude on the phone here I met in Detroit. You should talk to him because you're from Detroit. So I talked to this guy and it was Mick and we figured out that we only lived like two miles away from each yeah, other. Nice. So we arranged to meet. And so I think Mick rode his bike over to my mom and dad's house because I was still living with my parents at that point. Right. So that's how I met Mick. So I started hanging out with Mick quite a bit. Um, and I, you know, I don't think Mick had a car at that point. Yeah, or else he would have he drove to my house. He rode his bike. So I, would, I just hung out with him a lot, and I would drive over there and take him places, and we'd go see shows and stuff like that, and talk and talk and talk and talk, and he would tell me about all these bands that he had, and he would talk about them like they existed, but I found out they were actually all in his mind. Oh, wow. Um, and so I thought, well, this guy has awesome ideas. I mean... This is amazing. Like the way he talks about all these bands, they all have a certain kind of music that they're playing. They all have like a video, idea for a video, idea for a record cover. And I'd listen to records with Mick and, you know, we'd be listening to a record and he'd be like, look, listen to the drumming on this record or check out the sound of the room in the studio or check out that drum sound. And I'd never thought about stuff like that yeah. before, you know? Yeah. And he was into listening to music in that way. So he kind of showed me some of that, a different way of listening to music, a more, almost a more technical way, maybe. Excellent. Or we would listen to Detroit Soul Records, and he would say, man, this sounds exactly like a Motown record. In fact, it sounds like the guys from Motown are playing on this record. And I'd be like, wow, yeah, I guess it does, you know? Yeah. And it turns out, years later, yeah, that's actually what was happening. Right. Like, Motown guys were playing on records from other labels in town. Right. The Funk so Brothers, he, that kind of thing. The Funk Brothers. Yeah, yeah. And he could tell it was the Funk Brothers on these other records, you know? 
um, before we even before there was even even any documentation on that before there was any internet or anything you couldn't find that stuff out you couldn't just google stuff like that right. you know so he kind of like he had this incredible collection of records from his family because he was the youngest in his family by like 10 years so uh. he had a bunch of older brothers and sisters right. who had you know they were teenagers in the 60s so they had like all this all these records around the house yeah and i didn't have any older brothers or sisters i was the oldest so right. no one had turned me on to anything that i didn't hear on the radio classic rock radio you right. know wow that's crazy um well the one thing too i guess uh obviously growing up here i mean maybe you know, talk about Detroit growing up in the, you know, 70s and 80s, too, besides, you know, the music thing and... Um, well, well, you basically, know... Basically, like, not real quick, I don't mean, like, the thing I was, like, you know, doing the show and having you here, which is an honor, like I said before, you know, um, uh, the one thing is interviewing all things Detroit, you know what I mean? Right. Artists, musicians, those sort of things, and, of course, this is, like I said, our first one, and... Uh, so to get that perspective of you, you know, about Detroit, of course, uh, uh, I'm not from here originally. I've been in the D a few years and love it up here so much, you know what I mean? To get mm -hmm. things, and I just, I just want all things Detroit, you know? And right. to know someone um, that is, you know, Detroit native and things like that, to maybe talk about, you know, certain history that you like or things like that too would be cool. Well, I grew up in Detroit in the 70s. Um, yeah. And I always defined my experience in Detroit racially, right. to be perfectly honest. Right, I mean, I just never, like my parents, I don't know, I didn't come from any kind of racist background at all. Mm. Like my parents are very conservative, but not like openly racist. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, when I was a little kid, like my parents grew up in a white Detroit. Right. You know, and when I was a little kid, like in 1970, my neighborhood was mostly white. Um, and I went to a grade school in the neighborhood for kindergarten and first grade that was maybe like half and half when I went there in like 19, early 70s, 70, 71, 72. And so as I grew up in my neighborhood, all the white people moved out. Hmm. You know, uh, and I saw all these white people move away and black folks move in. Right. Now, did I perceive this as uh, something that was better or worse? No, I didn't perceive it that way. It right. was just a change. Right. That's just how things changed, you know. So I define like I've always defined it like, you know, OK, when I was a little, little kid, my neighborhood was mostly white and then it wasn't and it was mostly black. And so I mainly grew up in a, in a black Detroit, you know, and my, I went to University of Detroit High School, which was, I guess was probably like half and half when I was there. Right. It was the only Catholic high school that stayed in the city of Detroit. Right. The, all, all the other Catholic high schools moved out of Detroit. Wow. And the people, you know, like all the, the white people wanted them to move out. And they wouldn't do it. Right. They wanted to serve the city of Detroit no matter who was there. Nice. Um, but, you know, yeah. So I, 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 in the city of Detroit, was a minority growing up. Because Detroit became like an 80 or 90 percent black city. Right. Yeah, after, like, from 67 to 75, like, all the white folks skedaddled. Yeah. And even I've learned now, like back in the 50s, there was a big white flight, too. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, we didn't spend our summers in the city of Detroit, though. We spent our summers at the Detroit Yacht Club because my dad had a boat. Right. I love the Yacht Club. I love when it. I was eight years old, my dad bought a sailboat and he was at the Detroit Yacht Club. Now, Detroit Yacht Club had was very racist and they did not allow black people to uh 
belong there. But that policy changed, I'm not sure what year, probably sometime in the early 70s. But black folks still didn't go there. Like, they didn't want to. They knew the racist history of this place. But was, I had this strange dichotomy growing up because I grew up in a black Detroit. Yeah. And then we went to Detroit Yacht Club, which was pretty much all white. Yeah. It was weird. And we would drive through Belle Isle, which most white people wouldn't even go to Belle Isle in the 70s. Because, it, cause it, you know, I mean, there weren't any white people on Belle Isle in the 70s, unless you were really poor, basically, yeah. you know. But um, it was like we'd drive down Central Avenue, which is the cent- Central Avenue of Belle Isle, yeah. in the early 70s, and there would be custom vans lined up on both sides with the back facing the street and the back doors open they all had like murals on sides and velvet crushed velvet interiors and and this was like an all black thing so we were like driving through this didn't you know i don't know didn't like we weren't harassed or anything like that, but I mm. saw this thing, and then we went to this all-white island of mm. the Detroit Yacht Club. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to the Yacht Club recently, of course. Yeah. You know, when I'm kind of pre-COVID, and um, God, to know that, you know, I never really knew those stories, but uh, I um, got to go there through a pop-up event uh, mm-hmm. with my girlfriend who owns a vintage clothing store, and. Uh, I thought it was beautiful. You know what I mean? That, mm-hmm. that they were welcoming then, so I guess some of it's changed. Oh, I'm, it's changed a black. lot. I mean, it's changed <laughs> yeah, a lot. Cool. You know, cool. I mean, everything's changed a lot. Yeah, you of know? course. But I've come like, I've come now to find out that my parents are actually deeply racist. Right. <laughs> they're, I hope they're not. They're not going to be listening to this. Right. Yeah. But yeah, but not. you know it's weird <laughs> because a lot of people are like that. They grew up in a white Detroit. Right. And they associate. I don't know, man. It's like Detroit is so racially uh, tumultuous that I cannot define my experience in Detroit without talking about racial issues. Right. Because you can't ignore it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You can't. When you know? I've, uh, you know, being here and then going up to the, you know, by the UP and to the West a little bit and stuff like that, and I talked to some... Um, Older black folks, you just you know happen to meet being here, and uh, they were like, "Oh man, you don't go up north; it's racist." <laughs> like they all look just kind of like I'm feel standing weird going up north, right? Man. Yeah, you know, well, but it's it sucks that black folks have always felt this um, uh, obstruction of mobility. Right. Like you, no, don't go to Troy. Right. Because you're gonna get a DWB. You know. Like, you just don't, there's places where, as a black person, you know you just don't go. Right. Because you're going to get harassed. Yeah. And the same thing with white people, like white parents telling their kids, don't go south of 8 Mile. Right. You know, oh, lock your doors. We're south of 8 Mile, lock your doors. Right. You know, right. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's tragic. It's tragic. Well, it's, you know. And it sucks. But, I mean... But yeah, so Detroit, like, eh. so yeah, I mean, most of it I know as uh, Coleman Young being yeah. the mayor. I never knew a white mayor of Detroit. Right, right. Um, and because all the white folks moved out, the white folks have the wealth in this country. Yeah. That's just a fact of life, yeah. a sad effing fact of life. So when they pulled out, all the, the tax base went out. Right. So the right. city didn't have the money it had before. So they couldn't repair the roads. The police weren't as, as good. Like, the tr- public transportation wasn't as good. People, uh, you know, then the auto industry went downhill. So, so. I really grew up during the r- decline of Detroit. Right. You know, because this started when I was a little kid. Like, Detroit was going great guns in the 50s and 60s. Yeah up until maybe about 1970. I remember being a little kid in school, learning about the quote unquote energy crisis of 1973. I don't even remember now what the problem was, but they were having a problem with getting oil from the Middle East and oil wasn't as cheap as it used to be. And suddenly huge cars were, you know, out of fashion. People couldn't afford them anymore. Yeah. You know, so Japanese cars became more popular. Yeah. And Detroit auto industry was caught out of step and out of time, and the, the jobs went away. 
you know, and people were buying foreign cars. Um, and there weren't the jobs that people had anymore. You know, you couldn't just move to Detroit from Tennessee or Kentucky or Alabama or Georgia or Mississippi yeah. and uh, get a job any day of the week. That just wasn't happening anymore. So De Detroit began this decline economically and white folks, you know, in Oakland County and the surrounding counties didn't care. You know, yeah. did not care. That's heartbreaking. Um, it is. It's yeah. extremely heartbreaking. Right. And drugs like crack took a hold, mm. and Detroit became very lawless. Now, <laughs> out of this lawlessness grew right. certain things. Right. You know, because you had so many abandoned buildings, and so, and so uh, you know, you could... In, in, in such a small police presence mm. that you could basically do whatever you wanted, right. you know? Um, so you could have shows in abandoned buildings. Mm -hmm. You could have super cheap rent, right. you know? Yeah, so right. it was like, you know, I don't know, like mostly the, my experience is mostly in rock and roll stuff because that's what I know. Right, of course. And, you know, like you could be in a rock and roll band in Detroit and, and live very inexpensively, right. you know? And thus you had stuff like the hardcore scene at the Freezer Theater, which was right. a rundown building on, in the Cass Corridor mm -hmm. that some white kids rented and had shows there. Nice. I mean, you couldn't do that in, in any other city aside from Detroit right. because there was no police uh, and there was no regulation with the uh, building code and management all that kind of stuff there's none of that right i mean there the, all that system was totally broken down and nobody cared so then you know you could do like and that's i'm talking early 80s all during the 80s you know we had lots of bars that had local bands because it was cheap you know yeah and they didn't have to make lots of money to survive so they, they could take chances on local bands doing this, that, and the other thing. Um, uh, and then there was also, you know, starting, I guess, in the late 80s, early 90s, underground rave type parties, right, yeah. underground techno parties, yeah. let's, let's say. Let's call it techno. The, you know, now, unfortunately, techno, right. I wasn't into techno at that time, so I missed out on that stuff. Right. Um, uh, but 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 that was another thing that grew out of the lawlessness of Detroit mm -hmm. was having parties in abandoned buildings and right. that kind of thing. You know? Yeah, which is rad. Um, so rad. I remember like I do remember Electrifying Mojo, and I remember the age like in the early '80s when I was still in high school watching the scene, which was a local dance party right. show that came on after school it was on Channel 62, which was the first black-owned TV station in the country. Right. Um, yeah, I saw some about that recently too. It's some kind yeah. of this horrible thing. I was just uh, kind of scrolling by and saw some of you know what was. Uh, yeah, it's kind of incredible. You know. <laughs> yeah, no, so, there's a yeah. there's there's a great history here. So yeah, of course. So there was that black-owned TV station, and they broadcast on a, uh, a a UHF station, Channel 62. So after school, you know, you could turn on to this dance show, and they would play stuff when I was in high school, like Egyptian Lover. Right. And oh, Africa Bombada, and uh, in fact, I just found a record that was popular, uh, White Horse by Laidback, right. uh, you know, that kind of what they call electro funk. Right, of course. And I was, I remember that stuff, and I, I remember, I liked that stuff, and I remember when sort of electronic music is coming back or electronic music is taking over like in the early mid 90s there yeah. was all this stuff about that you know yeah. and i was like yeah you know there's some kind of electronic music that i like and i don't remember what it is and i started like trying to find out what that stuff was i remember from high school and then i started collecting those records and and all those early 80s electro funk stuff i was like that's my shit. That's right. like, yeah, it's amazing. that's the electric music. I like. Right. like all the stuff influenced from like craft work and things right. like that. Those right, guys. right, right. That's beautiful, man. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. I came to, uh, I remember, you know, growing up in the South, of course, but I used to go to raves. It was the thing. And, you know, I thought it was more of a, um, 
I'm not gonna use the word disco. I'm not a disco fan, but it was just kind of a movement, a modern day. You well, know it was what dance I mean? music. Yeah, exactly. And um, I had come up to Detroit from Louisville, Kentucky. You know, mm-hmm. it was a few hours away. And I went to Chicago for raves, Cincinnati, Memphis, Nashville. You know, and uh, even went to raves when I was living there for a number of years in Nashville. But then um, it was really dark. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I say dark, it was like people with eyeliner and very just like hard house and that kind of thing. But it was Almost just so like goth or what, something. Yeah, essentially. But it was just so spiritual. You know what I mean? It was uh-huh. amazing. It was this abandoned building um, as well. I mean, there were leaks in it. I remember that. <laughs> and uh, it was it was different. I was worried we were going to blow up, honestly. But then I was, uh, you know. Um, influenced in my mind at the time, so I enjoyed it. Uh, mm-hmm. I uh, met some good people when I was here even then, too. You know what I mean? And I saw kind of the, I don't I hate to really use it, but like the urban decay. But I, you know what I mean? Detroit was just so There's fucking gritty. There's a beauty gritty. in it. Yeah. Oh, there I is a beauty it. in it. There's so Absolutely. many beautiful homes, you know? Mm-hmm. And you'll just be on a, just, just so much history here. And just so I remember homes. so many more of those homes right. that have been torn down now. Yeah. That it's heartbreaking. It haunts my dreams. Like, wow. I have dreams of an old Detroit when all those old houses were still standing yeah. around the Cass Corridor era area particularly because so much of that stuff is torn down and the neighborhood where i live in the east side now there's not much of it left like it was just dance with homes and you know during like the 80s and 90s 90s particularly i think a lot of that stuff was torn down people couldn't afford to maintain their homes anymore you know, because yeah. the jobs weren't here. It's so tough. You know, and so it's like then they, they get these people get preyed upon, you know, by like predatory lenders, you know, uh, and predatory mortgages. And then when they can't afford to pay that stuff, they're ruined, you know. Yeah. And the one heartbreaking thing you see is like a house with a pretty new roof on it and pretty new vinyl siding that's burned out and destroyed because the person who was living there maybe took out a loan to get that stuff done trying to keep their house nice but couldn't afford to keep up with the payments and lost the house yeah no it's it's heartbreaking that is once again that is heartbreaking um well you know i wanted to kind of switch gears for a minute and um Talk about your other projects too, you know, the Dirt Bombs, Demolition Dolls, you know what I mean? Um, the Doll Rod, excuse me. And, uh, you know, if you want to talk about that for a minute too, besides, you know, the Gories and, um, you know, that'd be kind of uh, how yeah. that kind of came about and all those things. Too, oh, so. I wasn't in the Dirt Bombs. Right. Oh. But I was in Demolition Doll Rods. Right. I made a mistake. And I'm that was, that no, there. that's okay. Yeah. That was my band after um, the Gories. Uh, I kind of, well, there was, a, there was a couple things that happened after the Gores. One thing that happened was I started jamming with these guys who had a band called the Nervo Beats that right. I liked. And I was jamming with those guys, thinking about starting another band. And then concurrently with that, Margaret was cooking up a band in her head that I didn't really know about, mm. but she had this idea. So I was like, you know, I don't know, after the Gories, like later, around about 1990, 91, 92, I started getting more into 70s rock. And I started getting into like the Stooges and the MC5. Back in the 80s, I didn't care about anything from the late 60s. All I cared about was like mid 60s, garage music, British invasion stuff, that's all I cared about. Anything, after 1967 to me was hippie crap that I had no interest in. Right. Um, but like the Eagles or something. <laughs> oh yeah. Something I mean, like but, but even like right. psychedelic kind of stuff, you know, like the Stooges and the MC five were off my radar because wow. they were late sixties and I didn't, that I wasn't interested. Wow. And, uh, but, and even like Rob Tyner from the MC five was still around town going to, events around town that he was managing the band that mary cobra was in the vertical pillows right. he was managing those guys he would get up and sing with them sometimes and that blew me away because his voice was incredibly powerful but 
to me, he just was like, oh, some fat washed up hippie. Like I really didn't, <laughs> had no interest. I had no idea that the MC5 were like what they were, you know, and I, I wasn't into that music yet. So, so later, so, so then like we're getting into the 90s. I started getting into that stuff. I started discovering, oh, the MC5 was actually cool. It wasn't like hippie crap. It was, they were like hard driving, right. rock, punk rock, rock and roll. Oh, okay, this is cool. You know, and the Stooges, wow, yeah, this is punk rock, man. I'm, I can get into this. And uh, it's more closer to the Stones than to, I don't know, I'm, the Eagles isn't a good example. But right. something more, I can't even think of something right now. Right. But getting into the Eagles kind yeah. of thing. But, you know, soft rock or, <laughs> or yes, pop rock that. or, you know, it's like... Mm, psychedelia that I wasn't interested in. But anyway, so I started discovering that stuff and I wanted to do a band, Alice Cooper, like early Alice Cooper. I started getting more into that stuff. And so I was like, well, I want to do a band that represents those influences a little bit more. Oh. So I started thinking about this band, Rocket 455. Margaret had an Oldsmobile. She had like a 73 Oldsmobile with a Rocket engine in it and a uh, Rocket 455 engine in it. So I thought that's a cool name for a band. Perfect. I, so I was like wanting to start a band like that. So I was like playing with these guys from the Nervo Beats and we got this Rocket 455 going for a minute and I did a couple singles with those guys but Margaret was like coming to me with this idea and she was like, I got this idea for a band. Um, I want to call it the Demolition Doll Rise. Nice. I said, man, that's a great name. I'm in. Oh, yeah, Sounds it is. <laughs> She's like, okay, well, I want it to be an all-girl band, okay? But I want you to be in it. I want you to be a girl in my band. I was like, mm, okay. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Why not? I know. Yeah. Sounds rad, actually. Why not? So, yeah. You know? Right. That's a wild idea. Right. So I started getting into that. So I was doing Rocket 455 and the Doll Rods at the same time. Well, the Doll Rods started getting a little bit more popular. Like more shows and more offers to do records and stuff and the the schedules of rocket 45 55 and the doll rods began to conflict mm. so the guys in the rocket 455 made me choose you must choose brother you must choose <laughs> oh, man, that's tough. so super tough actually it wasn't that hard for me right of course <laughs> <laughs> i was like all right i'm going with the doll rods right because that was i mean i don't know margaret's Margaret's wild, and yeah. I wanted to get wild. And so um, I was like, all right, I'm going doll rods. And, and so I went with the doll rods, and then we just took off, and we started like just doing a bunch of shows, putting out albums, yeah. touring like crazy. Right. Um, we, Margaret got a van, and we started touring and sleeping in the van. We didn't even get hotel rooms. We would just sleep in the van. It's beautiful. Yeah, we just... do it. <laughs> I've been on a few vans myself. I know that. Well, do you want to um, kind of piggybacking off that? Do you want to maybe talk about your European tour or any of the tours or you know some of your fondest memories of that? Or well, just Europe in general. Yeah, exactly. Like when the Gories went, that kind of blew my mind because right. we were treated really well there. Right. We showed up at a little town in northern the north of the Netherlands called Groningen. Yeah. And everyone there knew who we were, nice. knew all about us, super excited for us to be there. And we were like, how the hell is this happening? Mm. That these people know all about us. Um, and we went to various places in Europe and like, we were like, you know, we were playing a show in France and you get dinner before the show and they put you up in a nice hotel and everywhere we went we we're getting dinner in a nice hotel and we we're like what the hell is going on here <laughs> you guys this are awesome like, that's what's going on this is cool right, so then right. after that i said i just wanted to tour in europe you know and this i'm talking like 1992 yeah when the gories toured there yeah so that. you know the doll rats toured over there a bunch and um i don't know just for some reason, Dalrods did well in Italy. Yeah. 
Uh, and we would do like five or seven even shows in Italy where most bands would do one or two shows in Italy right. wow. when they toured over there. So we went all over Italy from, uh, you know, top to bottom. Um, we even played like Slovenia, Ljubljana, Slovenia. Wow. Um, what was that like? <laughs> Man. Yeah, it was cool. Right. It was good. It wasn't that, that different. I mean, you're not like... It's just right on the border of Italy, so it's not that different. It's not like yeah. getting deeper into Eastern Europe, right. where it gets, you know, very different from Western Europe. It's not that different, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I can't think of anything specific except yeah. that we were well received and well taken care of, and it just made me want to do that more. Right. That's awesome. So what label was that? Were you wrong? With well, Dalrod started, started out, we did a 45 on it with a guy from San Francisco on a label out there. Uh -huh. And that actually got a little bit of attention. The guys, the Beastie Boys had a magazine for a hot minute called Grand Royal. Yeah. And yeah. they wrote about that first Dalrod's single. Oh, man, that's it. Yeah. Wow. And so we got a little, a picture in that magazine and stuff. And then uh, I think we might have did a couple 45s. I don't remember. Just like little labels. And then we did an album on In the Red Records out of Los Angeles. And I'd already right. known of them because that guy that runs that label, label was a Gorys fan. Right. And the Gorys right. had done a single with him. Nice. So I presented the Demolition Doll to him, and he liked it. So we did a whole album. It was recorded in Detroit and New York City, and some of it was produced by Mick in Detroit. Nice. Some of it was produced by John Spencer out in New York City. Whoa. John Spencer I knew because he was a Gorys fan, uh, and he, I think, contacted me when the Doll Rods first... Well, he contacted me when I was still in the Gorys, and he sent me like cassette demo tapes of the blues explosion before they even had a record out. Right. That's so, awesome. Man, I love John Spencer Blues Explosion. Yeah, man. That, those guys that, were on fire, oh man. Dalrods uh, Dalrods toured with them a bunch in right. the US and with your in Europe at the time when those guys were just killing it. They were just on fire, man. And wow. so that was a lot of fun. Wow. Man, that's rad. Jesus, that's cool. Um I guess, you know, pushing forward a little bit on that, um, you know, meeting Jack White and how that kind of came about and all that, being on Third Man, I got all that too. Um, I met him once in Nashville. Uh, ironically, you know, he's down yeah. there, splits time, obviously, Nashville, Detroit, different things like that. But uh, he was a great guy, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously being in Detroit, ironically now, and all that, you got Third Man here, you got Third Man down there, you know what I mean? Right, right. Doing, you know, those kind of things. But... Um, but yeah, you know, just throw it out there. Hell, I'm interested, you know what I mean? I guess I was always kind of wondering about that, you know, getting to know you and meet you and things like that, but, you know. Like so. how I met Jack and yeah, stuff? Yeah, or, you know, just talk about Third Man and your, you maybe we'll get to your, uh, you know, your second solo album here in a minute and those kind of things, your solo records. But, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so the, the hot and happening place in the mid to late 90s, probably more like late 90s, right. uh, into... Yeah, in the 90s, let's just say. Right, cool. <laughs> I'm trying to remember when the gold dollar started. Maybe like 96. You can Google that. Right. I don't yeah, remember. Cool. But anyway, gold dollar was the happening place in the 90s. And it's ground zero of Detroit garage rock and rock and roll, whatever, in the 90s. Yeah. So um, I started hearing about this band popping up. Uh, well, okay, so one thing that happened was some kids from California moved to Detroit. Okay. Which that, like, in the 80s and early 90s, that did not happen. <laughs> Nobody was moving to Detroit. Right. Nobody. People were getting the hell out of Detroit. Right. And, like, all the best talent got the hell out of here. Right. When moved to New York or L.A. or San yeah. Francisco or um, rinse and repeat. Yeah. So, uh you know, suddenly in the, the mid-90s, some kids from California moved to Detroit. I was like, what the hell is going on here? This is backwards. 
so I went and like started trying to find out who these kids were and hung out with them. And they had a band called uh, the the Bell Isles and I don't know something else. There's another aggregation. And they were renting a house in Woodbridge, and I went over there and jammed with those guys, trying to find out what these California people were all about. Right. And they were like playing at the Gold Dollar and stuff, and. Um, you know, that was like the first inkling of anybody. Now people are moving to Detroit from all over the place. You know, yeah. it's like a regular occurrence. Yeah, you know, I did, you know. Right. I'm glad I did, man. Yeah, you man. Know, being able to but at that time. Like, so anyway, yeah, yeah. the gold dollar was, was happening, and um, Dollar Rods played there, Dirt Bombs played there, yeah. The Go, and various touring bands. Uh, Johnny Walker was coming up from Toledo, and the, uh, what was his band was playing there. Mm-hmm the hell soledad brothers oh, okay. those guys so anyway i was at the gold yeah. dollar one time and this guy comes up to me he said hey are you dan from the gories i said yeah man what's your name he said i'm jack white i'm really happy to meet you i'm a big fan of the gories and i have this band called the white stripes and they, that's nice. when they were first first starting out right and um you know so i didn't even see the white stripes for maybe a year after they were kicking around Detroit a year or two and then I saw him I remember saw him at the Magic Stick Mm -hmm. and there was like 10 people there and saw him at the Hamtramck Art Fair Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) when there's just a handful of people there right but um, but I was like really into the thick of the doll rods at that point in fact we had the white stripes open up for the doll rods when we released our first album. Nice. So, cool. uh, so yeah, you know, I got to know Jack a bit. I went over and jammed with him one time when, you know, those guys were at the house he grew up in in Southwest Detroit. Yeah. I went over and jammed with him and Meg. And uh, then I produced this single, uh, yeah. Lily White Mama and Jack Platt Dad. Right. Um, so I'd done a couple things with Jack. That's cool. And, uh, yeah, got to know him yeah, good a dude. little bit. Yeah, I was, just, I was curious, you know what I mean? So I was kind of like, hey, you know, I just want to talk about those situations. But I guess um, with your two solo records mm-hmm. and stuff, uh, you know, kind of go on to that. Um, I listened to Detroit Blues again the other day. Mm-hmm. And uh, phenomenal, phenomenal record. Um, and... Uh, you know, if maybe you want to talk about that again. I, you know, I learned a few things from um, hearing you kind of introduce, you know, some of the songs, of course, I guess the whole record, that it, what I'd listen to. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, I think it's great. You know what I mean? This is uh, the blues and this is the soul that kind of rolls in and stuff like that and some um, more... Uh, I love this very... Some of the tracks to me were very Lead Belly influenced and yeah, stuff, and obviously sure. some of the old songs. But you know, you gave the whole history of you know every track on there. You know that I, when I was listening, and uh, yeah, it's know, in the liner like, notes. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. then I'm, you know, of course, and I'm talking about. It, I came across it again, like on. Well, let's just maybe just talk about that. I don't know. I mean, that record is. Uh, I've kind of wore it out the last uh, few days. I'm glad and, you like uh, it so yeah. much. Yeah. Oh man, you kidding me, man? You know. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I want to talk about that too. You know. So what specifically about. do you want to know about it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, just uh, something you obviously you know wanted to kind of shift gears with and that kind of thing. And uh, I didn't know if you wanted to kind of talk about that, how that kind of came about, and uh, you know. How I got into that kind of music? Right. Well, no, 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 I guess... Um, how it came there, about so. that I did that record on Third Man? Yeah, or? just, you know, that... Uh, I guess, how can I put it? I remember we had a... You kind of initially, when you and I had met, um, uh-huh. and like I said before, my girlfriend had a vintage clothing store in Southwest, and, you know, we, I was like, man, I thought you were the bee's knees, said, fuck, you know, I'd love to have this guy play, you know, and my mm-hmm. girlfriend and I talked about it and had you outside, and, um, you know, you did some of that album, you know what I mean, and you were doing some of your songs, and I just got more... Right. And I didn't really know much... In that aspect, besides what you know, with the doll rods and with the Gories and those kind of things, you know, prior. So, okay. just um, so were you were surprised by that? No, I, I, I fucking loved it. <laughs> you know what I no, mean? No, no, but I mean, you were you surprised that I did uh, something along those lines you didn't know before? Or? Right. Well, no, I mean, I hadn't had to get to know you and just first meeting you, I guess, I don't know, whatever yeah. it was, a year and a half ago or whatever. I was um, DJing. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, we met <laughs> at. Uh, 
guess it was Donovan's or it something. It was at like Donovan's. That, yeah. I was DJing at Donovan's. Yeah. That's when I first came, you know, was coming here every other weekend for a while to see my That girl. was before you moved here. Right, yeah. And then, uh, so I remember that night. But then, you know, getting for us to, you know, talk more and that kind of thing. But uh, right. it was great to have you there, you know what I mean, at the shop. Um, yes. Anyway, um, you know, if you want to talk about it a little bit, I don't know, just uh, wanting to kind of, you know, put that album, you know, out in the world and those sort of things, so. Well, I've been getting into that old, older time music for a while. Yeah. Um, collecting that stuff, discovering that stuff, collecting. Because I'm just like, I want to get to the roots of everything, you right. know? And he, even when I was like, you know, listening to FM rock radio, if they would say something like, here's a classic track from la 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 or here's the here's the track that started this or i was always really interested in where stuff came from right you know and i didn't discover blues from my parents they didn't play that music in the house right. they weren't i mean my mom liked like neil diamond and john denver <laughs> stuff like that right you know so uh i was uh, i don't know i got into that stuff from like kind of turning the dial on the radio and discovering some gospel radio stations on the radio um, and then getting into the Yardbirds and the Rolling Stones and trying to find out where that stuff came from, right. you know? So that's how I got into blues because they were, they were covering songs by Bo Diddley, Muddy Waters, yep. Howlin' Wolf. Yep. <laughs> so I started getting into that and then I'm like, well, where'd that come from? Okay, well, well, Howl and Wolf talks about Charlie Patton yeah. and all this stuff from like the 20s and 30s. So then I said, well, I'm going to go to the record store and I'm going to buy the oldest blues record in the store that I can find. Yeah, beautiful. So I found a Mississippi John Hurt record and it mm. said his first recording is 1928. Mm. I was like, man, that's old. Yeah. You know, I'm going to buy this record. So I listened to it. And it was nothing like any blues I'd ever heard. In fact, it wasn't blues. It was something else. Yeah. It was songs probably from like the 1870s or 60s, mm. you know? You know spirituals and stuff. They, yeah, yeah, and yeah. like folk songs yeah, kind of, you know? Yeah. Um, like finger picking yeah. stuff. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is interesting. This is nothing like... Howlin' Wolf or Chuck Berry or Muddy Waters, right. nothing at all like that. Right. So I started like getting interested in that, and then you know you get you like find Lead Belly and yeah. you find I don't know. I started like getting into oh Fortune Records with Electric Hillbilly and Electric Blue stuff. I was very intrigued by Fortune because they recorded not only a lot of really raw great blues they also recorded a lot of really raw super great hillbilly music because mm. um you know they it was all kinds of folks were moving up to detroit from the south yeah. to work in the auto industry and recording weird low budget records here they were really raw and intriguing to me um so i was getting into hillbilly stuff too and then discovering that sort of like the farther you get back in music the black and white traditions aren't that far apart anymore. Mm. You know, like not everything Lead Belly sang was blues. Right. A lot of it was kind of like folk songs that were common to the traditions of black and white folks. And that was very intriguing to me. Yeah. Because I wanted, I liked the idea of kind of bringing those together. I didn't want it to be just a blues album. I wanted to have... A, other elements in it and um hopefully bring like stuff that's known as the white tradition and together with a black tradition because when you get down to it it's just country music yeah like blues is just black folks country music right. yeah, it's country music 100 you know yeah so i think a lot of people don't know that or don't look at it that way or don't realize that mm -hmm. it's all just country music yeah you know, and yeah, even like, though I grew up in a city, like many city, middle-class city folk, yeah. I'm very intrigued by the country ways. 
<laughs> and country music. Right. And country, old country music. Yeah. You know. Yeah, real country. So, <laughs> right. A pure country. Real pure country music. Well, of course, I was born in Nashville, you know, so growing up there and uh, uh, in Louisville, you know, in Kentucky and Nashville, you know, I heard it all too. You know, there was a lot of great blues and a lot of finger picking, you know, banjo playing, all that. And um, I'm sure you know, more, a, than, more than is here. Really. Right. Yeah. It was, you know, but obviously to the migration to the, you know, the north from the south and leaving Jim Crow and coming up here for opportunities brought so much beauty here, you know what I mean, musically. Oh, it's hell Such yeah. a conglomeration, such a, you know, mixed mosh of just everything, you know. Yes. So, um, but yeah, man, that was my raisin down south, man, and that was that, you know what I mean? But right. you can, um, I think, uh, I don't know, one time I think like, uh, you know, Hank Williams Sr. had said, uh, you know, it's uh, country music is uh, three quarters in the truth. So, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so you really uh, take a look at all that and how it kind of comes into um, the blues element, like you were saying, and all that, and how it just, it's all intertwined, you know what I mean? You're yes, right. it is all intertwined. You know, um, and, yes, uh, it is. Well, that's great to hear that, you know, like I said, once again, I love the album and all that, and uh, it's great to see you perform it, you know what I mean, too, you know, uh, not too long ago, but, um, you know, I didn't want to keep you with this, I, uh, I saw something, I guess, at least shifting back to the Gories really quick, and we can kind of wrap it up here soon, if you okay. need be, but, um, Thanks for doing this again. You know, I mean, yeah, it's my you're first welcome. one, and man, I'm honored once again to have, uh, have you here. But um, I guess you guys have Riot Fest coming up, is that? Yeah. Uh, with the Gories, and right. um, should be fun and safe, I guess, with everything you know in the world going on. But uh, I hope so. Yeah. Yes. Fuck. I guess we all do these days. But it's uh, so. Um, are you going to be taking some time after that, I guess, for yourself and, you know, traveling? Or are you going to go to yes. any other shows? Yes, um, traveling to Italy because right. my, I'm married to an Italian citizen. Yes. And she has not seen her family in two years. Wow. Yeah, so, so we are overdue for a visit to her home country. Right. That's um, awesome, man. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad you're going to be able to get over there. Yeah. Well, I've met your wife. You know, she's lovely. And so uh, I think she had mentioned that the last time I saw her. And... Uh, to me and uh, you know my girlfriend so um, man like I said uh, this is the first one that I've done and man I can't thank you enough and um, Phil uh, hopefully I've asked some questions <laughs> that uh, you know have some kind of substance and uh, man thanks for just talking about you know what you guys are and what you're about and everything that uh, that's going on in the city of Detroit and everything like that and um, you know, there's so many great bands out there too that um, you know that's happening right now. And um, agree. I'm just and people, you know, really, you're kind of one of the, you're kind of a, somewhat of a founding father to some of the bands that are coming up. That really, you know, admire, you know, what you've been about and what you've been about to the city. So, yes. Um, who knew? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, well, I love I you, was, man. I was hoping it would end up that way. Right. <laughs> so I guess you know. Right. Of course. Did all right. Well, man, I can't thank you enough again. And uh, thank this is you, the Finn. first edition of First Fridays with Finn from Micah. Um, we do a First Fridays at my girlfriend's shop. Um, every first Friday of the month, we have bands play. And uh, um, I'm going to kind of coincide with that and put these podcasts out on that day. Um, I have um, Kristen and Eric from Ladyship Worship that will be here next week. And uh, stay tuned and uh, appreciate you all listening. Thank you. <laughs>